because it's worth trying. It's worth pointing out how absolutely unthinking it is a mindless thing to come out here with this repeal. And I yield back the balance of my time. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Georgia, Mr. Gingry. Madam Speaker, thank you. And I'm, my remarks will be about saving money, uh, but I can't help but take an opportunity to respond to the previous speaker, my good friend, the gentleman, the good doctor from the state of Washington. Uh, I would say to him, Madam Speaker, and to my colleagues, when we repeal Obamacare uh, that we'll do in this House next Wednesday, parents will once again be able to afford a health insurance policy on which to include their adult children. Uh, that's what we'll be doing. And as far as this uh, $110 billion worth of savings we lose in repealing Obamacare, Madam Speaker, we spent $1.1 trillion to save $110 billion. Hey, Madam Speaker, it's true. You can indeed go broke trying to save money. With that, Madam Speaker, let me uh, get on to uh, my five-minute uh, discussion. And I rise today to encourage my colleagues to recall the conversations they had with their constituents during the recent campaign season. And as we, we began the 112th Congress, to remember that the American people spoke with a resounding voice, didn't they, on November the 2nd. They told us to abide by the Constitution, to rein in spending, bring about economic stability, create jobs, and end the culture of crafting legislation in the dark of night, 2,400 pages on the health care bill, outside of the view of the public. In order to fulfill this mandate, we must fundamentally change the way we do business here in Washington. And I have taken the first steps by introducing several legislative initiatives this week, and they're all centered around the pursuit of meaningful government reform. Madam Speaker, transparency is an integral part of this package, and it's a necessary element for real government reform. For the first time, the Constitution, a document critical to understand our parameters and responsibility, it was read right here on the House today, on the House floor. I'm proud to have introduced a bill as part of my initiative stating that any legislation brought to the floor must cite its constitutional authority. Many may find it surprising to know, Madam Speaker, that while votes taken on the floor of the House are available on the net to view or on the website, that's not necessarily the case in committee. Therefore, my package also contains a committee transparency bill, and it would require committee votes to be posted online, the committee uh, website, within 48 hours so the American people are kept better informed of what their members are doing and how they're voting in the committee. Madam Speaker, the rejection by the American people of Democrats' reckless spending emphasizes the importance of fiscal responsibility, doesn't it? This is the reason I incorporated the Congressional Budget Accountability Act into my plan. Each year, my colleagues and I receive a fixed budget for all office expenses, and we call that the MRA, or the Member Representational Account. This bill would codify that our unused MRA funds must be returned to the Treasury for debt and deficit reduction. Along these lines, I've also included what's called the Fiscal Responsibility Act, which will re preclude any member of Congress from being eligible for a pay adjustment, so-called COLA, if we have incurred a budget deficit in the previous fiscal year. We may not have a balanced budget amendment, Madam Speaker, but that doesn't mean we can't balance the budget, and I want to hold our feet to the fire. This, this is yet another way that we can do that. Also in the package, Madam Speaker, is a bill to prevent federal employees from engaging in union activity on official time. It's amazing that this goes on. Uh, but we have estimated that in a five-year period of time, we could save the taxpayer over $600 uh, billion, I'm sorry, million, and $1.2 billion in a 10-year period of time. Put simply, it's unacceptable that the government employees paid with, yes, you, your tax dollars, are currently permitted to spend time during their work day performing union activities. And I've already given you the savings. Equally unacceptable is that legislators in Washington commonly attach legislation that cannot pass on its own merits to unrelated must-pass bills. Let me give you an example. Military Construction VA. A couple of years ago, we passed that out of committee 
with almost 100 percent bipartisan vote. The Democratic majority held that bill up for 100 days because they wanted to attach an unpopular bill, something like the DREAM Act or Don't Ask, Don't Tell, some controversial bill, and, and put our veterans at jeopardy, literally held them hostage. This bill, Madam Speaker, would say from now on, no attaching unpopular bills to good standalone bills, especially if they're for our veterans and the military. Madam Speaker, in conclusion, while these bills may seem like a small start compared to the big challenges we have ahead of us in this Congress, 112, it is a pathway to start, cha to start changing business as usual in Washington and fulfill the promises that we made on November the 2nd to the American people. And with that, Madam Speaker, I'll yield back the balance of my time. Ms. Kaptur of Ohio. Mr. McClintock of California. The chair recognizes Mr. McClintock for five minutes. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I rise today to express my hope that historians will look back on the 112th Congress as the session that restored American prosperity and to express my strong agreement with the new leaders of the House who have declared that every action of this body must be measured against this goal. We speak of jobs, 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 but jobs are merely a byproduct of prosperity, and prosperity is the product of freedom. Government does not create jobs or wealth. It merely redistributes them. Jobs and wealth can only be created through the free exchange of goods and services in a free market. Government's role is to create and protect the conditions which promote prosperity. If I give you a dollar for a cup of coffee, what, what's going on in that transaction? Well, I'm telling you that your cup of coffee is worth more to me than my dollar, and at the same time, you're telling me that my dollar is worth more to you than your cup of coffee. We make that exchange, and both of us go away with something of greater value than we took into it. Each of us goes away richer. That's the freedom that creates prosperity. That simple exchange, whether it's for a cup of coffee or a multi-billion dollar acquisition, that is what creates wealth. But now suppose some third party butts its nose into this transaction. Oh no, the coffee's got to be between 110 and 130 degrees and it has to include a swizzle stick and it has to be covered, it's going to be consumed more than 25 feet from the point of sale and on and on and on. Every one of these restrictions reduces the value of that exchange for the one or the both of us. That's the fundamental problem that we face today. Our government has not only failed to protect the freedom that creates prosperity, but it's become destructive of that freedom. To create jobs, we must restore prosperity, and to restore prosperity, we must restore freedom. We must restore the freedom of choice that gives consumers the ultimate say over the output of our economy. In a free and prosperous society, consumers vote every day with their own dollars on what kind of light bulbs they prefer or on how they want to get to work or what foods they like or how much water they want to put in their toilets or what kind of cars they want or what kind of housing they desire. These consumer choices signal every day what things are actually worth and what our economy will actually produce. Government is destroying the elegant simplicity of this process, and Congress must reverse this destruction. We must restore the freedom of individuals to enjoy the fruit of their own labor so that they can make these decisions for themselves once again. That's why excessive government spending is so destructive to prosperity. It destroys the freedom of individuals to make their own decisions over what to spend and where to invest their own money. It robs them of both the ability and the incentives to create prosperity. Presidents like Coolidge, Truman, Reagan, and Clinton, who have reduced government spending relative to GDP, all produced dramatic increases in productivity and prosperity and the general welfare of our nation. And presidents like Hoover, Roosevelt, Bush, and Obama, who have increased government spending relative to GDP, all produced or prolonged or deepened periods of economic recession and hardship and malaise. Our government's now embarked upon the latter course, and this Congress must reverse this direction. 
Government has an important role to play in the marketplace. It's there to assure that representations are accurate and that contracts are enforced. You have to tell the truth. You have to keep your promises. And government has an important role to play in assuring that. Government exists to assure that the currency is stable and reliable and that property rights are secure. When it fulfills this fundamental role, it maximizes the freedom that a buyer and seller have to assess their own needs and resources and to make those exchanges that allow both to go away better off than they were. Madam Speaker, let us together revive and restore the freedom and prosperity of this nation and fulfill that sacred command inscribed on our Liberty Bell to proclaim liberty throughout all the land and unto all the inhabitants thereof. I yield back. Mr. DeFazio of Oregon. Madam Speaker. For what purpose does the gentleman rise? I ask the permission to uh, speak for five minutes uh, out of order to revise and extend my remarks. With that objection, so ordered. Thank you, Madam Speaker. <coughs> and so this coming Wednesday, the really first order of, of real business of the House, uh, we are voting on uh, health care reform repeal. Uh, the new uh, Republican majority has decided that this is the most important issue, um, even though they know that it's political theater, a charade. It's not, uh, it, it, it may pass the House, but it won't pass the Senate, and certainly the President would veto it. So this is not becoming law. Um, at a time when uh, we have so many pressing issues, uh, I'm really saddened that the majority uh, wants to uh, conduct uh, this uh, political uh, charade. You know, if there are problems with the health care law, we don't have to repeal it. We could change parts of it. We could tweak it. We could put out of the bill what we don't like and keep in the bill what we do like. But unfortunately, uh, the attitude of the decision has been made to try to repeal the whole bill. My constituents understand and that as we speak now, the Rules Committee is, is discussing what kind of amendments uh, to allow. And we know no real meaningful amendments, if anything, are going to be allowed. So the Republican majority coming in says that they're going to have open rules. And uh, we're not going to really have an open rule on the very first bill uh, that they're going to uh, attempt to pass, which is a repeal uh, of health care reform. Uh, I think that's wrong. I think there are many of us who feel strongly that there ought to be uh, some uh, rules that we can, uh, some amendments that we can put in to uh, ensure uh, that, the, that the good coverage that we have achieved in the health care bill is kept. Uh, surely it's not everything uh, that's wrong with the health care bill, which my colleagues um, oppose. Um, I want to ask them, since they want to repeal the, re repeal the bill, uh, are they against the, uh, the, uh, the part of the bill which says that you can keep your child uh, on your health care uh, bill, uh, on your health care uh, coverage? till age 26. I think my, my um, constituents like that, and I think theirs do as well. Uh, do they want to repeal the part that says that uh, an insurance company can uh, no longer deny you coverage because of a so-called uh, pre-existing condition? I think that's something that all constituents like and appreciate. Do the people that want to repe repeal the health care reform bill want to uh, uh, say to insurance companies, it's okay to put caps on people so when they pay their premium year in and year out and then they finally get sick and they ask for coverage, the insurance companies can tell them, well, sorry, not only do you have a pre-existing condition, uh, but there's also a cap on benefits, either an annual cap or a lifetime cap. So therefore, uh, we're not uh, going to cover you at all. I, I don't think anybody's constituents wants that part uh, to be repealed. And what about the donut hole for seniors in Medicare Part D? You know, seniors have found it very, very difficult. Uh, they get part of their prescription drugs paid for, and then there's a donut hole, which is for a long time. Uh, they have to pay for everything themselves, while at the same time still paying their monthly premiums to the government. And then at the end, they get the government to come in and help them. That has put a tremendous burden uh, on seniors. And what the health care bill, which was passed uh, by the last Congress, does is it eventually removes that donut hole for seniors so that seniors can get back money and it starts right away where they can get back money to help pay uh, for those prescription drugs. So I, I think that um, we hear a lot about um, 
the lame duck session and how uh, we all work together and how uh, the big question of the new Congress is, is going to be, uh, is it going to be uh, a stalemate? Is it going to be gridlock? Or is it going to be uh, people coming together in a bipartisan uh, fashion uh, to try to, to work together? Um, if the first bill that the Republican majority is, is putting on the floor is any indication, uh, it seems to me that they've chosen gridlock. And I think I'm, I'm really sorry about that because I will admit that there are some things in the new health care law that should be changed and that we should work across the aisles uh, together uh, to make sure that changes. But to repeal the provisions that benefit my constituents and everyone else's constituents all across America to me makes no sense whatsoever. Uh, the big insurance companies have had it too big too long and my Republican colleagues unfortunately are right in bed with them. And I think that is something that the American people ought to, ought to see. Who do we care about, the big insurance companies, or do we care about the average American who is struggling day in and day out to get health care coverage? We have almost 50 million Americans without coverage, and it's not only the people who are not covered now, but it's working people who will find out in the days and months ahead if there is no health care bill that they will be added uh, to the roles of people uh, who are uncovered and that people working hard will find out that the 50 million will swell to 60 million and 70 million and maybe even more. And so it's going to affect all of us because the health care costs have been rising way, way beyond uh, the rate of inflation. And that's why uh, we needed to have health care reform. So I would say to my friends on the other side of the aisle, let's not uh, posture politically. Let's try to put our heads together and work in a bipartisan fashion to do something for the American people. If there's something in the bill that needs to be changed, then we should change it. But repeal is not the answer. Every major bill from Social Security to the Civil Rights Bills of the 1960s to Medicare and Medicaid all had to be tweaked after they were passed, all had to be changed a little bit. The same thing is with this bill. We should not repeal it. We should fix it. Thank you. I yield back. Mr. Goodlatte from Virginia. Madam Speaker, I uh, yeah, ask unanimous consent to uh, speak out of order to address the House for five minutes and to revise and extend my remarks. Without objection. Madam Speaker, earlier today, the uh, historic occasion of the first reading of the United States Constitution here on the floor of the House took place. And uh, it was a very good bipartisan occasion where nearly one third of all the members of the House of Representatives participated in that reading. Unfortunately, during the reading, one of the members, while they were reading from the notebook at the podium, turned two of the pages, and two pages of the Constitution were not read. And so I ask unanimous consent that I now read those pages and that they be placed into the reading of the Constitution as it occurred earlier today so that we have a complete reading of the Constitution. With that objection, so ordered. I'll now read at the end of Article 4, Section 4, the United States shall guarantee to every state in this union a republican form of government and shall protect each of them against invasion and on application of the legislature or of the executive when the legislature cannot be convened against domestic violence. Article 5, the Congress, whenever two-thirds of both houses shall deem it necessary, shall propose amendments to this Constitution or on the application of the legislatures of two-thirds of the several states shall call a convention for proposing amendments, which in either case shall be valid to all intents and purposes as part of this Constitution when ratified by the legislatures of three-fourths of the several states. That is the portion that was omitted earlier uh, and that by unanimous consent is now included in the reading of the Constitution. I thank the speaker and yield back. Mr. Burton of Indiana. So just drop down. Madam Speaker. For what purpose does the gentleman rise? I wish to uh, reclaim my time. Without objection. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, more border agents are being sent to the border. Uh, the border, as we all know, is uh, violent, dangerous, and it is not safe. Drugs and guns and people and money cross back and forth the border because two nations do not have operational control 
of that border. The border is desolate, it is hard, it is a war zone. But Madam Speaker, I am not talking about the border of the United States with Mexico. I am talking about the southern border or the border with Pakistan and Afghanistan. That's right, Border Patrol agents from the United States are going to Afghanistan to protect the Afghan border from the Taliban coming in from Pakistan. It is a war zone over there. And the Secretary of Homeland Security, Janet Napolitano, has said, we are going to contribute Border Patrol agents to protect the border of Afghanistan. <clears throat> there are already 25 there, <clears throat> and more are on the way. Now, Madam Speaker, <clears throat> why are Border Patrol agents from the United States going to Afghanistan? The Marines and our soldiers and our troops over there can do the job. But more importantly, we need the Border Patrol agents over here. Homeland Security means that the Secretary of Homeland Security protects the American homeland, not the homeland of some other nation. We need the help. In fact, we need the military on our southern border. Our border is a war zone. Drugs and people and money crisscross our border with Mexico. It is a violent place. <clears throat> it is the third front. More recently, we have had several people murdered on the battlefront on our border. Let me relate three of those. One of those was a 27-year-old female police chief in Mexico right on the border with the United States. <clears throat> chief Hermelia Garcia was on the job for 51 days and she was shot down and shot seven times by the drug cartels. Recent homicide on the border. Border Patrol agent Brian Terry was shot in the back while he was protecting our border. Ironically, he had been to Iraq and Afghanistan as a soldier, as a Marine, and now he was back here killed on our border. And David Hartley, a citizen, was murdered on Falcon Lake in Texas when he was with his wife, Tiffany, as they were viewing an old mission, shot and killed by the drug cartels. Our homeland is not protected <clears throat> adequately. And it's time that we put Border Patrol agents on our border, but also we put the National Guard on our southern border. It is the third front. <clears throat> Homeland Security should protect it. And that's just the way it is. I yield back. Mr. Jones, North Carolina. The gentleman is recognized. Madam Speaker, today I have a photograph of Tyler Jordan, whose father, Philip, was a Marine gunny sergeant killed in Iraq. I saw this photograph about five years ago in a national paper, and I felt that I needed to have this photograph for myself to be able to remind it of war and the pain of war. On Tuesday, I had the privilege and humbling experience to visit the wounded warriors at Walter Reed. I saw the pain these heroes were experiencing from the severe injuries they received fighting for this country. That's why today I show you the photograph of Tyler Jordan's pain as he holds a folded flag at his father's uh, funeral. This boy's pain and the pain of the heroes at Walter Reed is the reason I've joined my colleagues in both parties in asking President Obama to bring our troops home. Madam Speaker, this country is, has many problems and maybe I'm wrong but sadly, it seems to me the war in Afghanistan seems to be on the back burner. Before Christmas, I read from a Washington Post article that quoted President Karzai saying he now has three main enemies, the Taliban, the United States, and the international community. He said in that article that if he had to choose size today, he would choose the Taliban. There have been many articles written questioning the success of our troops in Afghanistan, but our troops have been successful. So why keep them in a country risking their lives when the president of that country supports the enemy? The Afghan government is corrupt. No one American life should be sacrificed for such a dysfunctional, excuse me, dysfunctional corrupt government. In mid-December, President Obama released a review of the American strategy in Afghanistan that painted a positive picture of the progress being made there. 
This review is at best dubious. And I agree with two national intelligence reports that were also released with a more realistic negative assessment uh, on the state of war and our chance for success. As I have said before, we are spending approximately $7 billion a month, which is $234 million a day to fight a windless war for a corrupt government. Why do we continue to spend $234 million a day so that some other child has to know Tyler's pain? In closing, I would like to ask God, as I do every day on the floor when I speak, to please bless our men and women in uniform. I ask God to please bless the families of our men and women in uniform. I ask God in his loving arms to hold the families who've given a child dying for freedom in Afghanistan and Iraq. I ask God to please bless the House and Senate that we will do what is right in the eyes of God for the American people. And I will ask God to give wisdom, strength, and courage to the President of the United States that he will do what is right in the eyes of the American people. And I will say three times, God, please, God, please, God, please continue to bless America. I yield back. The gentleman yields back. Mr. Franks of Arizona. The purpose is the gentleman for California rise. I ask unanimous consent to speak out of order, Madam Speaker. So order the gentlelady is recognized for five minutes. Thank you very much. Uh, Madam Speaker, this week, as the 112th Congress begins, there's a lot of talk from the Republicans about ending business as usual and doing things differently than before. But for all the supposed change afoot, there's one critical matter on which the new majority is fully embracing the status quo, the war in Afghanistan that is now nearly a decade old. This war has been going on so long that 55% of my colleagues weren't here when it started. We've heard plenty about changing the House rules, about changing the ways we conduct the, bus the nation's business, about changing the relationship between the government and the people. We've even heard about how a new law that will provide affordable health care to all Americans is somehow the greatest threat to the Republic and the constitutional order. But on the subject of war, a disastrous war that has taken the lives of more than 1,400 Americans in Afghanistan and cost taxpayers some $366 billion, the new congressional majority is interested in no change whatsoever. In his speech yesterday, Speaker Boehner spoke of giving government back to the people. In his speech, he talked about honesty, accountability, and responsibility, and responsiveness. Look, if he meant that, he should be listening to the 60% of people who believe the war in Afghanistan is not worth fighting. A clear majority of Americans realize what so many Washington refuse to acknowledge, that this war represents an epic failure, a national embarrassment, and a moral blight on our nation. On this matter of life and death, this issue that will determine how history judges the United States, most of the representatives in the House, and the People's House at that, have told the people that their point of view doesn't matter, that we know better than what they know. As usual, the people are way ahead of their policymakers, just as they were four years ago on Iraq. They may hear reassuring platitudes from Washington about how we're on track, but they can see the news for themselves. They can see that the security situation is in decline, that casualties are up, that the Taliban is strong, and that Afghan governance is ineffective at the very best and corrupt at the worst. So I can't think of anything more patronizing than to tell them not to worry their pretty little heads about the war, that us grown-ups in Washington have it all taken care of. We're not bowing before them, Ms. Madam Speaker. We're sticking our finger in their eyes. 
Do we truly believe it's about them and not us? Do we truly believe that we are caretakers whose only legitimacy derives from our employees who elected us? If that's true, then it's time for representatives of the People's House to start listening to the people. With that, it's time to bring our troops home. I yield back. Gentlewoman yields back. Under the Speaker's announcement, announced policy of January 5, 2011, the gentleman from Missouri, Mr. Aiken, is recognized for 60 minutes as the designee of the Majority Leader. Thank you, Madam Chair. I uh, appreciate an opportunity to talk about a subject that I think has been on a lot of Americans' minds over the past, uh, particularly the last couple of years, and it's the, uh, the subject of uh, spending cuts in the federal government. Now, unless people are perhaps uh, tuned in to some other planet, they realize that the federal government is spending more money than we take in, and so we're running all of these deficits. Therefore, uh, the idea is, is that we need to do some spending cuts. So that's what we wanted to talk about here for a little while, and I'm joined by some good friends and some very uh, trusted congressmen on this subject. Uh, just to try to frame what we're talking about a little bit, and I usually have some charts to go along with this, but the charts haven't been printed yet. If you take a look, these are pretty simple numbers, if you take a look at the spending projection for 2011, it's uh, 3 trillion 834 billion, and uh, the income projection is Two trillion five hundred sixty-seven billion. Uh, the two numbers aren't the same as you notice, and basically we're spending uh, more than a trillion, close to a trillion and a half dollars that we don't have, and that suggests for most Americans that have some level of common sense that we're going to have to make some cuts in spending. So uh, that's the um, that's the overall subject, and I think it's one that gets everybody's attention and that we need to give some thought to. Now, um, obviously, right off the beginning of the bat, the uh, new party, the Republicans, are running the House, uh, and we're trying to start off setting a, a good note uh, in being fiscally responsible. Today, we just voted to cut the congressional, uh, there, there's a fund that's allocated to each congressman for them to run their office, to make their airplane flights, to pay phone bills and things like that. We cut that 5% just as, um, in a sense, an indication of the fact we're serious about doing this spending cuts. That certainly doesn't get us to where we have to go, uh, but at least it's a start. And um, the, uh, there are a number of different ways we can approach the subject, but one of the other things that we'll be voting on this week, aside from the 5% cut in congressional budgets, is the fact that we want to get rid of this tremendously expensive government takeover of the uh, health care in America. Uh, it's known as Obamacare, I suppose. And uh, I'm joined by a good friend uh, who has joined me in the floor many times in the past two years, a medical doctor from Georgia, Dr. Gingry. And, uh, and he is um, somebody who knows inside and out not only the medical profession, but this bill, which has the government taking over all of health care. Now, as you can imagine, that would be expensive. It would be expensive to American citizens. It would be expensive to businesses and uh, expensive to the federal government. So one place we can we start talking about spending cuts is what we'll be voting on before too long, which was to get rid of this government takeover of health care. And, and for that reason, I would like to recognize my good friend, uh, Dr. Congressman Gingry from Georgia. Madam Speaker, I appreciate the gentleman from Missouri uh, yielding, and I know that when he was referring to my medical expertise and in regard to knowing that subject inside and out, no pun was intended uh, <laughs> when he mentioned that, but <laughs> I do know a lot more about health care probably than I do about government spending. 
But one thing's for sure, uh, Madam Speaker, as the gentleman pointed out, we are spending way too much money, uh, and I think the, the, the figures today, uh, this year, last year, uh, we spent a third more than we took in. I mean, you know, we have a revenue stream from, from taxation of the American people, uh, and yet we went beyond that uh, by, by a trillion dollars of borrowed money. And, of course, of the non-domestic non uh, creditors, the largest one uh, is China. Uh, they hold a lot of our debt. Uh, they happen to be now the second largest economy in the world at $9 trillion uh, uh, GDP. Uh, we have about a $15 trillion GDP. But the thing that is so scary and frightening about that is we owe $14 trillion. So our debt to GDP ratio is approaching 100 percent. So, you know, we're, when we stand up, uh, Madam Speaker, uh, as we're doing right now and talk about this issue, uh, we're almost in a panic. And we should be because we're right on the precipice, right on the edge of becoming uh, part of the PIGS acronym. Uh, Portugal, uh, Italy, uh, Ireland, Greece, Spain, uh, and, and uh, you know, we point the finger at them, but goodness gracious, it's like the old the Bible, the scripture that I'm sure the representative from Missouri probably knows by heart, but it goes something like, if you've got a, uh, a plank in your own eye, you shouldn't be pointing out the speck in somebody else's. Uh, we've got a plank in our own eye, and and uh, this is why in this 112th Congress, uh, we have a huge challenge, don't we, my colleagues? We have a huge challenge. We're up to it. We're up to it. And I hope that we're going to be up to it on both sides of the aisle. But, so, uh, uh, so let's say we do, uh, let's say that we uh, get what you've been working for, and, um, and let's just say by, by some great miracle that we were able to stop that Obamacare. Now, that would save a whole, whole lot of money, wouldn't it? In terms of well, re reclaiming the time that yeah. the gentleman has yielded to me, uh, Madam Speaker, uh, absolutely. You know, the gentleman from from Washington, our our esteemed colleague, uh, physician, uh, Mr. McDermott, was uh, on the floor a little early and talking about well, uh, what we were trying to do in repealing uh, Obamacare or the formally. Uh, recognition of that bill, Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act. Yeah, I call it socialized <laughs> medicine. That's easier, but go ahead. <laughs> that's a lot easier, socialized medicine, Madam Speaker, uh, because that's essentially what it is. That's essentially what the former uh, majority party uh, were pushing toward. Uh, but the gentleman uh, who spoke t uh, said, well, it's a stunt. These Republicans know they can't repeal Obamacare. And furthermore, even if they did, it would be at a cost of $200 billion. And I, what I pointed out to him, Madam Speaker, as he was leaving the floor was, yeah, uh, you know, that's uh, really interesting. Uh, it's going to cost us $200 billion, if that's accurate, to repeal. Well, it cost us $1.1 trillion to enact. So you can literally go broke saving money, can't you? Uh, and by golly, we're going to repeal it, because that's what the American people want. Uh, if we feel sh uh, fall short in our efforts, uh, despite 110 uh, percent on this side of the aisle, uh, or well, in this body and on the other body, uh, then we have, we have a backup plan B. Uh, and I know my colleagues would like to talk about that. And so uh, I'll yield back to the gentleman from Missouri, and uh, let's continue the discussion. Well, I appreciate your medical expertise and your, your overview. Uh, obviously, uh, if the federal government isn't jumping into taking over all of health care, there's going to be a lot more in the private sector. And we'll maybe get into that a little bit about what really should the federal government be doing and what should we allow states to do and what should we allow the free market economy to do. Uh, we're also joined, uh, it seems like the way things are working today, we've got uh, Georgia very well represented. And uh, uh, Congressman Tom Graves from Georgia has joined us before on the floor. Uh, you always have an interesting and articulate perspective, and this is kind of a, a pet topic for a lot of us that think that government isn't a servant anymore, but it's the master. So if you say, hey, let's do some, let's start cutting government, that's kind of an interesting topic. I'd like you to join us, please, Tom. Well, I, th I thank the gentleman from Missouri, and, and you're right. I mean, today, what a breath of fresh air to hear the syllables of the Constitution recited from members all throughout this body. 
leading into this topic and this discussion because we really want to address spending cuts and the proper role of government. What better way to start it than reciting the Constitution today? And hopefully, members of this body listened and heard. They didn't get up and just read a sentence or two or an amendment. They actually consumed it in their mind and, and are starting to understand what it means because for too long, the federal government has been kicking the can down the road on spending, saying, oh, elect me, elect me, and we will cut spending. When you look at the data, it's clear deficit spending has occurred at an average just in the last fiscal year, probably $110 billion a month deficit spending. Oh, wait, has just stop. $110 billion a month. That used to be the deficit in a whole year. Right. But we're, wow, we're setting all kinds of records in the wrong direction. You're right, and, and that, that leads up to this discussion that we're hearing now in the media, which I don't know where they've been over the last uh, uh, several months talking about the debt ceiling. Well, the, the reason we're approaching and about to pierce the debt ceiling is this deficit spending that's occurred from the previous uh, uh, leadership here in the House, as well as the administration who's still there. And, uh, you know, as we approach this debt ceiling, we have got to push spending cuts more and more and more. And I'm thankful that, uh, you know, I just was sworn in for the second time yesterday. Been We're glad to have you back again, well, and we thank the good people of Georgia for making a good decision there. Well, well, thank you. But being appointed to the Appropriations Committee, it is clear, and I've made it clear uh, to my constituents, I'm not going on as a spender. I'm going on as a saver. It seems for far too long members would seek to be on appropriations because they wanted to spend money. Well, guess what? It's a new day, a new era, and it's, a, it's just a fresh day when you have members going on to say, here's how we're going to save money. So what a great debate we're going to have in the next several weeks. That's good. Now, let's, let's get on to this just a little bit more. Let's try to get into the details uh, uh, in terms of procedurally. Okay, now you've got uh, a new Congress. The Republicans are in the majority, and we got the problem. We take a look at the numbers, and we're spending a third more than what we're taking in, so we know we've got to do some cutting. And yet, um, one of the things that people want to pin us down on, okay, you guys are such big mouths about cutting spending. What, what are you going to not fund? Because that's going to be some group you're going to get mad at you. Mm -hmm. So how do you approach it? And one thing that uh, I know in state governments they do sometimes is they say, well, what we've got to do is we're 10% over budget, so we need to cut 10% off of everything. That makes it seem to be fair. And that would be one way you might approach what we've got going on. Oh, you're, you're absolutely right. I think what well, we've heard about repealing Obamacare, uh, you know, to, yesterday I introduced the legislation again to defund it, to take away all authorizing funds going to the legislation as well, which is another step forward. You know, why don't we defund some czars? I mean, that's a, that's a whole other discussion that we've all seen. And then as we move back to those 2008 levels, and we might need to go even just a little bit further and begin cutting more and more and more. I mean, it, are the decisions going to be difficult? Sure they are. But that's well, why let me, your let me, let me lay and out uh, elected us to come here and make those tough decisions. You know, Congressman Graves, let me, let me lay out two ways you could approach it. If you've got just a little bit you've got to cut, you could maybe take a little bit from everything. But there's another way you could take a look at it when you've got to cut one-third. One way you could do it would be to say, what are the essential functions that the federal government has to do and what are things that we really don't have to do because the state could do it mm. or the private sector could do it? You're right. And I'm not so sure that there's. Oh, excuse me. Yes. Uh, Might be good to oh. yeah. Yes, I, I yield, Mr. Speaker. If the gentleman uh, could suspend, and if uh, Representative Sessions, Representative Fitzgerald, Fitzpatrick, I'm sorry, from Pennsylvania, uh, show themselves in a well, I uh, would be happy to swear them in as new members. If you raise your right hand, do you solemnly swear that you will support and defend the Constitution? of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic, that you will bear true faith and witness and allegiance, I'm sorry, to the same, uh, that you take this obligation freely without any mental reservation or purpose of evasion, that you will well and faithfully discharge the duties of the office on which you were about to enter, so help you God. Thank you. Congratulations. You are now officially members. Uh, this gentleman from Missouri uh, may resume. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. So uh, we were just talking about now you've got the situation where the federal government's spending a third more than it takes in, so we've got to figure out some way how you're going to skin this cat. 
And in one way, it's just trying to take a certain 10% or whatever the percentage is. It actually be 33% off of everything or whatever. Or what you could say would be, what are the things that we have to do and what are the things that maybe are nice but we can't afford it? And what are the things that may be actually unconstitutional? Mm. And, uh, and I suspect in order, when you're one-third over budget, it's going to be hard to just do a, a set percentage across the board. I suspect we're going to get into, I think, some very interesting questions about what's really constitutional and does the federal government really have to do that function? Maybe it's an important thing to get done, but maybe the federal government shouldn't do it. So I just wanted, if you wanted to uh, sure, jump I'll, in on that subject. I, 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 yeah, I'd be happy just to yeah. add a little bit more to that. I think a few approaches you could take. One, you can ask the question, is it duplicative? Is it occurring somewhere else? Is another agency or department doing it? And that's after you've cleared the hurdle. Is it a, a, a role of the federal government in general itself? Is, then you could ask also, is it something you could devolve back to the states? Have we usurped the states in which I would, uh, I would think many members of our, uh, our conference here would probably agree in some cases the federal government has uh, overstepped its bounds and it's time to remove ourselves from the states and allow the states to take over. But you know from a, a, a business owner's perspective, what if you looked at the department heads or the agency heads and you said, you go back and you cut 25% and you bring back your recommendations and then you show us a budget estimate of, with 20% cuts and then one with 10% empower those agency heads to make those decisions to analyze their departments and come back while we're also and on the theme of uh, physicians we're taking a surgical approach as well as pulling out those unnecessary programs as well so that would be some some approaches I would take but those are some great recommendations here to reinforce what you said I, I didn't have time to get some of the charts that we normally have printed but here's some examples we've got 342 economic development programs. Do you think we really need 342 of them? Talk about duplicative. That with, seems to make with, your point. With unemployment at what? Yeah, yeah, yeah 10% yeah, or right, whatever. Right. 130 programs serving the disabled. Do we need 130? Maybe it'd be better to consolidate just to a couple of good ones. And then 130 programs serving at-risk youth. And um, so these are all of these things where you say, it doesn't even make common sense. We have to really start getting into analyzing, first of all, should we even be doing it? And then if we should, do we need hundreds of programs doing something that should be done with one or two? We're, uh, I, I uh, see that uh, Dr. Gingry is back at it again. He just couldn't sit still when we talk about cutting things. So uh, just welcome to the discussion. Madam Speaker, I appreciate the gentleman for yielding back to me. And I, uh, I know we've got two other colleagues on the floor that want to speak. I can only stay for a few more minutes because of a prior uh, engagement, so thank you for giving me an opportunity kind of uh, in front of the queue, if you will. Uh, but I'll tell you, one of the things uh, in regard to how you cut, uh, is it, is it uh, by picking and choosing or in one fell swoop across the board? You know, we just passed a, a bill uh, last vote of the day uh, in regard to our own budgets. Uh, and that was a 5% across the board cut, Madam Speaker, in our member representational account, our expense account, that, we are, that we're allotted each year to pay our, the salaries of our staff members and to have a round trip flight back to our districts once a week. Uh, and, and those budgets vary a little bit depending on, uh, obviously somebody from California is going to have more travel expense than somebody like myself. And, uh, Representative Grace from Georgia, but we just basically voted to cut 5%. Uh, and and I, I, quite honestly, in, in this question that has come up, Madam Speaker, my colleagues talk about, well, how do you do it? Uh, I, I just think we more and more need to look at this thing and say, there are no sacred cows. Uh, and, and let these departments uh, uh, make their case for why uh, maybe there shouldn't be an across the board 2%, 3%, 4% cut. Uh, I know I voted in favor of that. Every time it comes up on these appropriations bills, we didn't get to vote on any in the 111th Congress because our Democratic colleagues didn't get the work done. Uh, but this is something we need to really look at carefully. I know that, uh, that most people, Madam Speaker, are reluctant to talk about cutting Homeland Security and 
uh, cutting national defense, particularly when we have two wars going on and certainly not wanting to cut the veterans' benefits. But there's waste, fraud, and abuse and duplication of things in, across every spectrum of this federal government. If we're going to get serious about it, we need to have an adult conversation. And, Madam Speaker, uh, and my colleagues, that includes entitlements as well. Because we don't address entitlements, we're looking at one-sixth of the budget, and we're never going to get there uh, just addressing that small portion of the budget. With that, I'll yield back and continue to listen to my colleagues. Well, hey, Doctor, it's a, a, a treat to have you on the floor, and I'm going to run over to uh, moving a little bit from Georgia to the west to the great state of Utah. And uh, Congressman Bishop, you've joined us on the floor a number of times. and. Um, one of the questions that, uh, let's say that you were on the budget committee or something and you're trying to prioritize, how are you going to, uh, guns and butter, how are you going to prioritize uh, defense versus uh, endowment for the arts or whatever it is, how do, how do we crack this nut about uh, trying to reduce federal spending? I would uh, appreciate your perspective. Let me try and uh, hit for just one moment uh, two potential areas to, to address that particular question. And it goes back to the fact that we did read the Constitution on the floor today. You know, it's amazing, as P.J. O'Rourke once said, that uh, the Constitution is 16 pages, which is the operator's manual for 300 million people. The operator's manual for the Toyota Camry, in contrast, is four times as large, and it only seats five. But you also contrast that with what we have done in the lame duck session when the Senate's uh, omnibus spending bill was not 16 pages, it was 1,924 pages. Those are the kinds of issues we're talking about. And I think if we really want an answer of how we make those decisions, we go back to the document that was read this morning. The general welfare clause today usually puts the emphasis on the word welfare. When they wrote that thing, they put the emphasis on the word general. What the federal government should do is that which affects all of us. Monroe, Madison, Jackson vetoed road projects because they said those road projects didn't meet the general welfare. When Savannah burned to the ground, the Congress had a great deal of empathy for Savannah, but it not, did not actually appropriate any money for Savannah because they said giving money to Savannah to rebuild would simply help Savannah and was not general Welfare. Now, I made this speech once on the floor a couple of years ago, and I got a nice letter, kind of, from a lady in Alabama who took me to task and listed all the programs that she thought were, were viable and good and she wanted continued. And I said, ma'am, you actually missed the ultimate point. The point is not should these programs be available for citizens. The point is who should be responsible for providing those programs. Not every idea has to germinate, be funded, be appropriated, be regulated from Washington. The states are equally competent, and if indeed we divided our responsibilities together, we could provide better services to the people for a cheaper price. Now, Mr. Aiken, if I could just give one second of a, a simple example. David Walker has written a great book called Rebirth of Federalism where he simply made the effect that dangling money we don't have in front of cash star states does not necessarily help out the states or us or the taxpayers who have to foot the bill for both levels of government. For example, he said, when we put conditional grants to states with strings attached that eventually become regulations and mandates, it undercuts both the interlevel cooperation between those two bodies and it is a term he invented called creeping conditionalism, which means the cost to the taxpayer actually increases. By doing his estimates, the Safe, Water, Safe Drinking Water Act of 1986 cost the states two to three billion dollars more than the states would have spent to provide their own safe drinking water. From 83 to 90, he estimated that the regulations imposed by the federal government was nine to 13 billion dollars more in local taxes that did not provide a benefit to the citizens. It was just the creeping cost to them so that our mandates, supposedly with free money given to states, ends up costing the taxpayer not only for the free money we don't have, but costs the states to do more than they would have done or needed to do to actually address the problem. To meet the mandates. To meet yeah. the mandates. You know, uh, interestingly, and I can't help but piggyback just a little bit on your point, gentlemen, uh, it used to be a very boring place to be a congressman down here because there were almost no laws on the books. Do you know the federal laws to begin with, in terms of laws about right and wrong, were one of them was 
a, a law against piracy on the high seas. Another one was against counterfeiting. Another one was a law against espionage. Uh, those three laws were the main laws on the books federally. And what did they have in common? Well, just exactly your point, piracy, counterfeiting, and espionage against our country were against the general welfare. They were laws that affected everything. So laws against murder and rape and stealing and all that kind of stuff were all state laws because the states made all those laws. So you had a very limited jurisdiction federally. And now, as you say, we've got all of these different sort of creeping red tape which keep costing in an insidious way everybody's cost of living keeps slipping up but you don't really know why who's nibbling all the money out of your wallet but it's because of a lot of those things that you're talking about and I appreciate that uh, perspective you share with I promised uh, my good friend from Louisiana Congressman Scalise uh, he is uh, has become this last year or two an expert on oil rigs and oil spills and everything but uh, uh, good on many other topics as well and wanted to, when we start talking about cutting government I've got to let you have a piece of the action my friend. Well I uh, want to thank my friend from up the Mississippi River in Missouri uh, Madam Speaker for yielding to me and, and talking about this important issue because uh, there seems to be a lot of energy as we're talking about energy in this house I think yesterday was so exciting to see I think not only the gavel ceremoniously passed from Nancy Pelosi to now Speaker Boehner uh, but also that, that these principles that are in the Constitution be restored to the people. This is the people's house, and it should operate as the people's house. And I think now it's starting to get back to those principles that, that we articulated today when we read the Constitution, uh, a real uplifting experience. Sad, uh, unfortunately, to note as we look through history that this was the first time that the entire U.S. Constitution was read on the House floor. I think this should be an event that occurs every new Congress uh, so that we reestablish and remind ourselves uh, just what we're up here to uphold. Uh, and as we talk about the, the spending issues of the country, I think one area that shows you where spending has gotten out of control is, is if you go to the 10th Amendment. The 10th Amendment to the Constitution, as I know my friend from Utah is such a, a proud proponent, uh, the powers not delegated to the United States by the Constitution nor prohibited to it by the states are reserved to the states respectively or to the people. And yet, if you look at so many of the things that we're doing up here in Washington that this federal government has gotten so expansive in doing, uh, have absolutely nothing to do with powers that were delegated in the Constitution. And in fact, one of the big debates we're going to have here this week, our first week here under this new Congress, is about a, this government takeover of health care that a federal court just ruled is not constitutional. Federal government does not, under federal, uh, federal court uh, ruling now, does not have the authority to mandate that American citizens have to buy a private product as a condition of citizenship. Uh, so I think the fact that not only today did we put our money where our mouths are uh, by voting to cut our own budgets, because as we're talking about cutting all throughout government, where there's duplication, where there are departments that shouldn't even exist, these czars, these 30 or so shadow government figures that are running their own almost cabinets, uh, like a secret, a secret uh, cabinet that's running out there, and every one of them has multi-million dollar budgets and staffs, uh, and they're not accountable to anybody except the president, not to the people, not to the Senate, that the Constitution says they should be doing. Uh, we're going to be going and looking at all of those areas to make serious cuts, but then we also have to look and of course tomorrow we'll be voting on the start of the process to repeal Obamacare uh, and, and do what the courts have already said, this isn't constitutional, it shouldn't be on the books, and get rid of that unconstitutional mandate with all the bad taxes and other things that go with it. But then we've got to look at creating jobs. And I think that's where you get into an area where while we're cutting spending, which we need to do aggressively, we also need to unleash the potential of the individual. It's not government here in Washington that makes this a great country and really the greatest country in the history of the world, it's the power of our, our people back home, the, the, the small business owner, the, 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 the stay-at-home mom who's, who's raising a family, the people that actually make this country work. And, and there's no place, I don't think, any more evident of what's wrong with Washington and hurting that opportunity than in my home state where you've got this permitorium going on uh, since after the BP disaster in the Gulf of Mexico. It's the president's policies not the actions and failures of BP, it's the president's policies that according to the White House have put 12,000 people out of work through what's called a permitorium. Uh, the government 
has said all of the companies that didn't do anything wrong, the companies that played by the rules, that follow all the best safety guidelines in the world and had no problems, now the government has shut them down, put them out of work, I, I and they're not even issuing but, permits. I can't help but just jumping in a little bit. It, it just keeps coming back to my mind as you talk about the particular situation, the, the job-killing mandates that are coming from the administration, I keep thinking... An awful lot of Americans must be starting to feel the same way I do, that the government's not a servant anymore, that it's a fearful master. We were warned by the forefathers that if you let your government, your federal government, get out of control, it will become a fearful master. And um, it seems to me that that's kind of what's starting to happen. And I think the, the last election was an understanding across the whole country that this government needs to be put back in its proper place, being a servant of the people and doing programs that are constitutional instead of things that people just think of, wow, it'd be a great idea if we mandate this or mandate that. And here you have an example of an area that's already had a tough hit from the, the oil spill, and we're going to take businesses that done nothing wrong, and we're going to basically shut them down because of some mandate. And, and somehow or other, I don't, I don't see that as being government the servant, do you? Well, and in fact, it's, it's, it's exactly the opposite of the government being the servant. It's, it's the government...